Hello. Um, it's, oops, I'll just see if that works. Um, I'm Nicole Ritchie, obviously not the one on the left, I'm the one on the right. Um, I'm a project manager at Amazie IO and I'm also a Drupal South committee member. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit more about create, creating high performing teams today. Unfortunately, we've only got 10 minutes, so I'm just going to dive in. It's a very high level overview, but I'll be in the Maisie booth all day. So if you have any questions, um, just come and see me. Um, you've probably all wondered what qualities high performing teams share. And today I'd just like to give you a high level overview of two proven and practical techniques to develop an, affecting an effective team and drive performance. Uh -huh. So the first one I'd like to introduce you to is Professor Richard Heckman. Um, he says, no leader can make a team perform well, but all leaders can create conditions um, that increase the likelihood that it will. So in 2002, Professor Heckman um, came up with a method or um, described six conditions that he reckons um, from research that represent the main features of a team. And um, so every team needs a very solid foundation, which is the essentials, um, which is a real team. Um, the people should be dedicated. It shouldn't just be randomly put together. Um, it should be team tasks and um, everyone should actually know what the collective outcome should be. And the roles and responsibilities need to be clear. Um, so the um, team should be stable for a prolonged period of time. And then it's also important to have the right people. Make sure that your team has technical as well as soft skills to be able to bring the best out in each other and also to work collaboratively. <laughs> um, and then the team should have a compelling direction. Why are we doing this? Where are we going? What's the bigger picture? Don't just give me small tasks. Like you need to make sure that the whole team is following a common goal. And um, roles and responsibilities need to be clear. And also the work should be challenging. Make sure it's um, make sure it's it's challenging, but also obviously um, don't overload the team. Make sure that the the work that needs to be achieved is possible. And then also the work is consequential. The team should be aware that your effort that you put in is also or has an impact on the success of the team as well as the organization. And once we've got a, the essentials or a solid foundation, we can then move into the team environment and look at um, providing an enabling structure. Have the right size team. Heckman says a team shouldn't be more than eight people. And also have a written code of conduct. Make sure that everyone has meaningful tasks um, and we all follow a common strategy. And then also make sure that you provide the right support to the um, team. Is there training material? Um, is there the right um, education? Um, and then also that feeds into the coaching. Um, Heckman says that you don't need to, when you at the start of a project, you don't need to have every skill set um, in your team that you'll need to achieve your goal. Start with a smaller team and then provide coaching and provide experts the team can um, turn to. Cool. Um, this is just a summary of what um, I was just explaining, what the conditions are and the criteria. I just left it in the slides so people can um, later on follow up. The next thing I'd like to um, look at are the stages of team development. Um, the person I'd like to introduce you here is Bruce Tuckman. He is best known for his five stages of group development, known as the forming, storming, norming, and performing theory. And that was developed in 1965. Cool. Let's look into um, the different conditions into a bit more detail. So um, Tuckman says that every team starts with a forming phase where everyone's on their best behavior, everyone's getting to know each other, everyone's making an effort, everyone brings different experience to the team. Some team members may be excited about the upcoming work and others may be really anxious. 
um, usually in the forming phase, there's a lack of clarity. And it's really, really important for the scrum master or team leader um, to to have clear um, or have, have clear guidance um, and develop the roles and responsibilities together with the team. Um, this phase is also like if if you um, if you use um, project management tools, then you might want to look at a team charter um, in the forming stage. The next stage is the storming. So that's when when team members start testing the boundaries. They're starting to get to know each other. Um, everyone, like I said before, everyone brings a different experience. Everyone brings different baggage, and there might be quite a bit of um, conflict in this phase. Um, it's also a phase where people don't know each other too well, so you might still be focusing on your own um, task and achievement rather than actually the group goals. Um, and it's really important in this phase that we identify goals for the team so that everyone um, can move into the right direction or into the same direction. The next stage is the norming phase where team members really know each other. There might be some team building. Um, in this phase, the trust and respect grows and you start resolving um, issues amongst the teams. And also they usually um, start appreciate, appreciating each other's skills and knowledge and turn to each other. Um, however, in this phase, there might still be a lot, of a lot of conflict or there might still be problems or issues. So the team is not actually at um, its best performance level yet because um, they're still trying to um, sort of issues. And in this phase, it's also really important to give each other feedback, um, give constructive feedback, and also support each other. And then we're getting to the performing phase. This is a phase where, you know, all the friction, everything should actually be resolved. Um, there's a high level of trust. There's um, people respect each other and they motivate each other. And they also turn to each other when they have questions. Um, which means for the scrum master or for the team lead, you can take a step back and um, there's no supervision needed because the structure and processes work really well. Um, if there are, sometimes it happens that uh, a team falls back into a previous stage and this is when the team leader steps in and provides coaching or, um, or support to be able to get back into um, better performing um, rhythm. And it's obviously also um, in this space, it's um, also very important to celebrate the successes and not just rush from one stressful event into the next or from, from one stressful sprint to the next. Um, it's really important to celebrate your successes. And then in 1977, he also added that journey phase, um, which is really just important when you run a project um, with one team and then everyone goes into separate directions which means that in this phase that most goals have been accomplished, um, the emphasis is on wrapping up and team members start um, being reassigned to other tasks. Cool. And this is just on a, um, just to, to visualize the effectiveness. And it's really important that, um, that especially the scrum masters and team leads are aware of the different phases of, the, of team building to um, be aware that if, if the team's in a storming phase and going through issues and problems, that the effectiveness is, um, is not quite as, as good as, um, as it should be. So you really need to look at um, the different conditions and help the team to, um, to reach the next phase. Cool. All right, um, we've only got 30 seconds left um, so I'll just have a quick chat into the Q&A to see if there are any questions but I'll be in the Amazie um, booth all day so please come and see me um, I'll also you're also more than welcome to email me or reach out on Twitter well I don't actually think we've got time for questions so just come and see me in the booth <laughs>